Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our midweek Bible studies. We are honored to have you with us tonight. Glad that you're here and uh, ready to learn and ready to study the Word of God. But it's always good to be in the presence of the Lord and in the company of each other. We're grateful to God that you take time out every midweek on Wednesdays and study together and log on and um, enjoy the stream and a part of our family, I just want to say thank you. I know that there are so many options that you all have every single Wednesday, and um, I'm grateful that the Lord has impressed upon your heart to spend your Wednesday evenings with us. We try to make certain that the teaching is engaging and that the Spirit of the Lord um, is always invited and welcome and able to take over and take charge in the times that we share together because I want you to grow. I want you to grow in your walk with God, to grow in your understanding of the Word of God, and to grow in how you apply the truth of the Word to your life and to your circumstances, and so that you'll see measurable change in every area of your life. That's why we teach. That's why we're here Wednesday after Wednesday after Wednesday sharing the Word of God. So welcome to each of you. Glad you're here. Do me a favor. If you would please put in the chat space just a, um, uh, a little note, if you're not watching from the city of Atlanta, we'd love to know that. If you're watching in some other city or some other part of the country or even some other part of the world, we'd love to be able to know that and be able to greet you. So please put that in the chat space. And also, if this is your first time with us at a uh, New Life Midweek Worship Experience, please put that in the chat space as well. We would love to get a chance to greet you properly and to let you know how honored we are that you are part of our time together tonight. Please like or share this stream if you would just kind of click the thumbs up button or share it with those in your networks and let others know that um, New Life is on the air and Bible studies is being taught tonight. All right, come on, let's pray. Let's ask God to bless our time together. Father, we thank you for your blessings over us all day. That Lord, you've been faithful to us. You have kept your word and you've honored your promises. Every one of your promises are true. They're all yes and amen, and we honor you, Lord, because you have been faithful to all that you have said. Now, Father, I pray that you will demonstrate that kind of faithfulness tonight as we study your word, that we would look into the truths of the word of God. We would see our lives in it. We'd see power in it. We'd see life change in it. We'd see wisdom in it, oh God. Help us to get a clearer shot and picture and preview of who you are. Allow us to see you in all of your glory and all of your greatness. May we be mesmerized by what we see when we look into your face and your presence tonight. And so, Lord, I pray that you will arrest us, take over this experience, have your way with us. I ask you, God, that you would make it so that your spirit is so tangible and so felt tonight that we know that we have been in the presence of the Lord. And we'll give your name praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless God. Well, praise God again. Welcome to each of you. Glad you're with us. A couple things I want you to know about that's happening here at our church. One is we want everybody to get registered for our 5K. We are excited about our 5K run, or 5K run walk, and uh, I want you to get registered. I want you to be a part of it, to be involved in our 5K. We are going to not only do it for health reasons and to get in shape, but also for fellowship reasons as well, to get to know each other, to get to know our church family and our larger city at large, and of course, all the registration proceeds. All of the registration proceeds are going to go towards our community alliance, all the programs all the efforts, everything we're doing at New Life, it goes directly into, those, in, into that effort. And so we need you to register. If you're not going to run or you don't know if you're going to run or not, get registered anyway. I'm praying that you'll be a part of the 5K. It's going to be fun. It's going to be engaging. It's going to be a lot of folks involved, and I want you to be there and to be a part of the experience. So there's two races. Please listen. There are two races. The first one is going to be on April the 13th. 
13th, and that is virtual only. That is virtual, not in person, but virtual. Wherever you are in the city, in the parks that you live, that, that uh, you live close by, in your community, in your subdivision, your apartment complex, wherever you are, down at the track, at the uh, high school or uh, middle school track, wherever you are, we are asking you to simply take your phone or take um, your watch and just record the race and uh, let us know what your times were. You can upload a video or upload a photo or anything of that nature, and you'll sh we'll share with you how to do all of that when you get registered. So that is on the 13th of April, April the 13th. Then one week later, the next Saturday is going to be the in-person race. This is when we'll come together on campus and run in our community. We've got a great route planned for you. It's a great... Um, time to get together with friends and with um, church members and city members and those who are part of our larger community and to have a blast, just to have fun sharing together. We're going to do a warm-up, get in shape, and then we're going to hit the road and run the 5K. I'm going to win this year as I always do. I always win 5K. I always do it. I'm going to win again. You don't believe me? Come. Register and come and see it. You'll see. You'll see. I'll show you. You'll see I'm just playing. But it's going to be a great experience, and I really pray that you are a part of it. Love to see you there. It's our 5K. All right, so secondly, on this coming Saturday, we're having our Kingdom Conversations Part 2 for our men's ministry, Kingdom Conversations Part 2 for the men's ministry. Don't miss it this Saturday. It's going to be at 9 o'clock in the morning. So all the men of our church, all the men of our church, as well as um, men and friends connected to our church, we're inviting you to be here on campus in the sanctuary at 9 o'clock on this coming Saturday for Kingdom Conversations. It is Kingdom Conversations Part Number 2. I'm going to be there with a host of our other ministers and elders. We're going to be on stage and in a panel and addressing questions and addressing topics that impact the lives of men. So please, listen to me, guys, wherever you are. Don't miss this this Saturday. We're going to be talking about marriage and family. We're going to be talking about finances and work. We're going to be talking about the scriptures, about discipleship, about sharing your faith. We're talking about what it means to be a godly man, to lead your family, to love your spouse and lead your children. And I want you to be there to hear this. There's so much wisdom that will be on this stage with ministers of our church and elders in our church. It's a lot of wisdom. And those of you that are hungry for that knowledge and wisdom and that kind of connection, please make it a point to be here on this coming Saturday, a great time for you to also meet other brothers in the church. And so I pray that you'll be a part of that. That's Kingdom Conversations, part two. It's going to be this Saturday, March the 9th at 9 a.m., right here in the sanctuary. There will also be a streaming option for those of you that are unable to come, of course. You can watch this by stream. We'll be streaming it, and you'll be able to watch it on all of our streaming venues on this Saturday. So it's not just for the men that are in the room, but also for men that are not in the room, that are virtual, anywhere at all. You'll have an opportunity to join it by stream, and that information will be shared with you as you get registered. So please go to our website or scan the QR code and get registered today for Kingdom Conversations. Also want to mention that we're having a special job fair on uh, next Tuesday, March the 12th from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. It's two hours, two hours only, but it's a special job fair and I want you to be to make certain that you're there. Whether you're just starting out or a seasoned pro in work, we're asking you to be a part of this job fair. If you are in need of work or if you know someone who is in need of employment or work, don't let them miss this coming job fair. It's going to be next Tuesday. March the 12th, Tuesday, March the 12th, starting at 10 o'clock in the morning until 12 noon, 10 a.m. to 12 noon. It's going to be on our campus, um, and it's, of course, for local jobs, and so we encourage you to be there. We have a, a job connection center here at our alliance, and it is amazing, the number of job offers that are made, the number of people that have gotten employed is phenomenal. We have a special 
uh, data center that is located right in our building, right in our building, right in our facility through a partnership we have with an organization called People Shores. And we're going to be sponsoring a job fair that's going to highlight and spotlight People Shores. And this is hiring individuals from our local community and having full scale training as well as full scale data center work um, right on the spot starting as soon as the job fair is over the very next day we get you processed and get you in uh, to that environment and so if you're in need of any kind of resources or if people that you know friends and family are in need of other resources and it's hindering them from getting work have them at this job fair we have wraparound services that we can address individual needs that may be barriers to long-term employment do not miss next Tuesday, March 12th, for our job fair. And all God's people said, amen. All right, well, our last announcement, and that is we're ready for this coming Sunday. It is Women's Emphasis Sunday for Women's History Month. And um, this Sunday is going to be a special Sunday. We have as our special guest, Miss Zernona Clayton. Miss Zernona Clayton, who is a, a civil rights icon. She is a television icon, founder of the Trumpet Awards. I mean, just so much that Miss Clayton has done in her life, working with CNN, working in television industry uh, across the country. She's touched lives of people, not only in America, but around the world. She's a paragon of class and beauty as well as uh, women's excellence, and you want to be certain that you're here on this coming Sunday. It's going to be our 9 o'clock service and 11.30 service, 9 o'clock in the room and online, and 11.30 online only. Don't miss it. Tune in or get in the room and make certain that your daughter or that your uh, niece or your little sister or a lady in your life is there. We want to make certain that young women are going to be present. Our theme is young lady, you show up. Young lady, you show up. How to be present, how to bring the best of you to every environment that you come into. How to be present, bring the best of you. To be proud and honored is as to who God made you to be and make a significant impact in the world around you. Being a girl or guy, being male or female, gender doesn't matter. You show up, and if you show up, I promise you, God will always show out. So don't miss this coming Sunday with Mrs. Anona Clayton. Amen. All right, well, it's time to give. We honor the Lord for the privilege we have to sow seeds into ministry. We do not take it lightly that God has given us the opportunity to give. He has given us the blessings to give from. So I pray that you'll uh, take advantage of this opportunity to come in agreement with heaven and to give to God's agenda. As you support God's agenda, you know that God supports yours. As you build God's kingdom, God builds your house. As you build God's kingdom, God builds your house. He takes care of your life as you honor his purposes and his agenda. And the Lord has such a massive agenda, ministry, blessing people, changing lives, touching people's hearts, ministering to folks where they are. That is the agenda of God, seeing to it that the gospel is preached throughout the world, that we preach the gospel in practical ways, through words, through deeds, through actions, and our giving enables that to happen. So I'm praying that you'll be faithful in giving tonight. 100% of everything that we give on Wednesday nights goes directly into our community alliance. 100% of everything that's given goes directly into outreach, directly into our community activities and community outreaches. So I know that you want to be a blessing to those who live in this area and a blessing to those who are in need. So please give generously and give faithfully tonight. Don't forget about your dream campaign offerings. Many of you have given to dream, but not enough of you have given to dream. God is speaking to your heart. You've not given yet. You've not made that commitment, or you've made it and you've slacked off from it. May I encourage you, get back in it. Let's give. Let's support ministry. Let's make certain that we are able to grow the kingdom of God in every capacity, and that's what dream is about. So, Father, I pray that you'll bless our time in giving, that you'll honor your word in every person's life as we give to ministry and to the work of the kingdom. Now, Lord, I pray that you will have your way with every family and every heart and every home and every household that's giving tonight. Bless them and bless them in 
indeed. In Jesus' name, amen and amen again. All right, let's take out our smartphones or our tablets and uh, our devices and prepare to give. There are three ways you can give. They should be on the bottom of your screen. You can always send in your gifts through our, the mail to the address on the bottom of your screen. You can give by going to our website, clicking on the giving tab, or you can text to give simply by texting the word New Life ATL to the number 77977. You can give in any of those three capacities. I thank you in advance for giving. Let's take a moment, give as a family together, and then we'll be right back, right after this, with the word of the Lord tonight. Let's give. All God's people said, Amen. Well, grab your Bibles, please. Let's open them to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 5. We are concluding our time in Revelation 5 and preparing for this time of opening of the seven seals in Revelation chapter 6. So tonight we're going to look at chapter 5 in its completion and uh, study the ministry of worship that Revelation 5 teaches. What it teaches about worship, particularly the song that we sing as an aspect of worship. And we're going to look at how worship has been expressed in heaven tonight. And it's going to be a blessing. So let's jump right in. Well, I want to read Revelation chapter 5 again, one more time for us. I want to make certain that we hear the word of God, that we hear this book in our reading so that you can at least, have, you can at least say, I have read the book of Revelation because I did it every Wednesday, uh, every Wednesday in Bible study. So let's come together, read it together. We're going to start at verse 7 of Revelation 5 tonight. Verse 7 of Revelation chapter 5. And when you found it, say amen. Verse 7, Revelation 5. It says, And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe and tongue and nation and people, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying blessing and honor and glory and power. Be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. 
Then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and ever. I get the thought as I am reading this particular uh, section of waves of worship. You just hear waves of repeat worship. They fall down, they sing, they declare glory and honor and strength and majesty and power to him who sits on the throne and lives and then they repeat forever and ever and ever. And you get the notion and idea that every creature on the earth is worshiping God. This is not just every, all of creation is worshiping him. Everything his hands have made is worshiping him. The angels in heaven, all the celestial beings that are, num that are, that are numberless, that you cannot count, they are numberless and they're worshiping God. They're singing and worshiping and honoring the Lord. And then you have the church, the saints. I mean, it is just an amazing picture of wave after wave wave after wave of worship. And then you see it happening in the text over and over and over and over again. Repetition is the intent here as you are reading this passage that it happens now, then it happens again, then it happens again, then it happens again to say that heaven is filled with the activity of worship. Heaven is filled with the practice of worship. Heaven is filled with with worship. And that's exactly what Revelation chapter number five is teaching us. More specifically, as we've studied in the past in this chapter, just very quickly, just to make certain that we're all on the same page. First, there is a sealed scroll. And we told you that this sealed scroll is not a scroll that is sealed completely, um, but it's a scroll that has successive seals on it. And each broken seal reveals some section of the scroll. A picture of the sealed scroll is behind us, and it shows that each area is broken, and there is an opening of one seal, then an opening of the second seal, and then an opening of the third, the fourth, and then all the way down to the seventh. And each one reveals certain aspects or rights or sections of this scroll. And this sealed scroll, as we studied before, is in effect the title deed of God's will and plan for the earth. This is God's will and God's purposes and plan for all of humanity and for all of human history yet to be done. It's the consummation of all things. This is not only the end of time and the end of the world, but it is the consummation of God's plan for the world. This is the coronation of the king. This is how the earth receives its full maturation. It's all written in this scroll. And in the scroll is the writings that have the power to bring about the experiences and to bring about um, God's, God's will and plan for the earth in its preview for, huge, for, for, for the future. And as this is seen in the scroll, the scroll is significant because as long as it's sealed, then none of God's plans for the earth can be accomplished. And so the unsealing of the scroll becomes important because as the seals are popped, so an aspect of God's plan for the future becomes aware and starts to take place. And so because of that, we see the next area is it says that this happens when the end shall come. Daniel was told to seal up the scroll until the time of the end to seal the scroll until the time of the end, for the time is not yet. Seal the writings. God's will is waiting. God's will is on pause, and it's waiting. We've been on pause for uh, the last, goodness, what, uh, nearly 2,000 years we've been on pause, and the scroll has been locked, but the end shall come. And here's what happens when the end comes, as the Bible says. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and verse 24 through 25, it talks about what happens at the end. It says, and then comes the end. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God, the Father, and when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. 
for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 24 through verse 25. It says, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God, the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and all power, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The end comes whenever he delivers the kingdom to God, the Father. When he delivers the kingdom, the kingdoms of this world, the kingdoms and nations of this world. We see it more clearly in Revelation chapter 11 and verses 15 through 16 about what happens when the end comes. Look at Revelation 11 verses 15 and 16. It says, then the seventh angel sounded. And we'll talk about who the seventh angel is when we get to that. And there were loud voices in heaven saying the kingdoms of this world, look at what they're saying. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. It says the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, the kingdoms of this world. You may remember the temptation that, uh, that Satan gave to Christ in the desert when he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Remember that final temptation that is recorded in both Matthew and Luke. In that final temptation, Satan shows him all the kingdoms of this world and the glory of them and says, all this I'll give to you if you'll bow down and worship me. You remember that temptation? Well, this is that. If you would go back to this passage, this is that. It says the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. What Satan offered, Jesus did not take it from Satan's offer. Jesus took it as a part of his death, resurrection, and victory. That he takes the kingdoms of this world and he now gives them to our Lord. It says the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. And he shall reign over every kingdom forever. This is all the wealth, all the power of the kingdoms of the earth. America and Russia and Korea and China. And all the powers of the Middle East, of Israel and all the powers of Europe. All the powers of this world, all the wealth of this world, all the glory of this world, all the money, the power, the fame, the fortune, all that this world has to offer, everything that it means to be a part of this earth, it says Jesus will conquer all of it and it all will be given to him. He conquers it and reigns forever and ever. That this is the meaning of the opening of the scrolls. And so if the scrolls do not open, then this reality cannot happen. This is the reason why we move from the sealed scroll to the sobbing servant. You see John the servant who's writing and he begins to sob and to cry and to weep bitterly because no one was found to open the scrolls. So I wept much, he says in verse number 4 of Revelation chapter 5 and verse 4. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. Can't read it, can't open it, meaning that this end cannot come. This consummation cannot come. This maturity of the earth will never come. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And so we spoke about him prevailing and he opens the scroll and he looses the seven seals. Then we move from the seven sealed book, the seven sealed scroll to the sobbing servant and now the sacrificial lamb. We look at the sacrificed lamb. The sacrifice lamb. It says in Revelation chapter 5 and verse number 6. John says, and I looked and behold in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And look at what it says very clearly right in the middle of that verse. It says, having seven horns 
horns. I saw a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns. Now, we stated to you last time together that lambs don't have horns. And so only rams have horns. A lamb is a young lamb. It's a young sheep, a young lamb. That's what a lamb is. It's young. It has immatured. It's a child. It's a baby ewe lamb. It doesn't have any horns. It says this is clearly a lamb, but it's a lamb with horns, meaning that this is a lamb that is a ram. That is a ram. A ram, as we showed you in our photo on last time together, this is a sheep with horns. All a ram is is a sheep with horns. It is power. It's aggressive. It is masculine. It is aggressive. It rams. It charges. It fights. But yet it is humble and meek. It is so humble you can shear it. You can take its wool. It's both fierce and it is both humble at the same time. And this is the nature of Christ. He is meek and low, but yet he is high and mighty. He is meek but strong. He is a warring Christ, and he is a saving Christ. He is above us, and he is with us at the same time. The dual nature of Jesus is seen in this particular epic. And so he is a lamb with horns, and it's seven horns. These seven horns represent the totality of his power, the totality of his strength. Horns are always images in the book of Revelation of strength and power. It's what horns mean. And Jesus, the lamb, has seven of them, full, complete, total power. All power, he said, is given unto me in heaven and on earth when he rose from the dead. And so we see this lamb. Now, the next thing it says in verse 6 is not only is this ram with seven horns, but it also has seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. It has seven eyes as well. The eyes in Revelation often speak of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The ministry of the Holy Spirit, it has as an intimation, it has as an idea, the thought and the idea of wisdom, insight, knowledge, omniscience. That's, that is intimated by the word eyes, understanding, wisdom, knowledge, insight. That's intimated by the word eyes, a function of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit illuminates, the Holy Spirit shines, the Holy Spirit explains, the Holy Spirit, it enlightens. And so as we see the Spirit of God, we see seven spirits, which is not seven different spirits of God, as the text would seem to suggest by the reading of the English, but it is the sevenfold spirit is a better way to understand what this means. A sevenfold spirit or seven aspects of the Holy Spirit. Now, most commentators pull this from the book of Isaiah, chapter 11. They see this sevenfold nature of the Holy Spirit. Now, I want us to get a chance to take a look at it. In Isaiah, chapter 11, in Isaiah, chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, it says, There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, rod and branch is a prefigured meaning of Christ. It speaks of Jesus Christ in a prophetic capacity. There is a rod and a stem of Jesse, and a branch will grow out of his roots. Jesse is the father of King David, and so the rod of the stem of Jesse is the lineage of David, the lineage from Jesse into David, and this rod or this branch that grows is growing from that line or that kingly lineage that Jesus is the king who sits on the throne of David, his national position as the king of Israel and his universal position as the king of kings. So it's speaking messianically, prophetically about Jesus Christ. He is, there shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, father of David, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The branch, of course, is Christ. He is the righteous branch, as the Bible calls him in another place. And then it says in verses 2, in verse 2, the critical verse about the Holy Spirit. It says, the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. 
The spirit of the Lord rests upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. There are seven terms here in Isaiah 11 verse 2 for the Holy Spirit. First, it is the identifying nature of the Spirit, of, of the Lord. It's called the Spirit of Yahweh. The Spirit of Yahweh. It is the identifying nature of the Lord. God's identifying nature is Spirit. Jesus said that to the woman at the well in John chapter 4. In John chapter 4, Jesus said that God is a Spirit that God is a spirit. He didn't say God has a spirit. He didn't say God possesses a spirit. He said God is a spirit. God is a spirit. And so the first part of this passage is the spirit of the Lord. This is the identifying nature of God. So that's number one. Number two is the spirit of wisdom. Number three, the spirit of understanding. Number four, it is the spirit of counsel. Number five, the spirit of strength, power, might. Number six, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of knowledge, understanding, knowledge. And then, of course, lastly, number seven, the spirit of the fear of the Lord or the reverence for God or the knowledge of God that evokes a reverence of him to fully understand who God is. This is a sevenfold nature of the Spirit, and this is what many commentators believe is meant in the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 5 here, about the seven eyes of the Lamb, which are the seven spirits of God, or the sevenfold Spirit of God, as is seen by the sevenfold nature of the Holy Spirit in Isaiah chapter number 11. All right, so now we move very quickly to the last section of this chapter, and that is the singing servants, the singing servants, the very last section of this chapter. We have talked about the seven-sealed book. We've talked about the sobbing servant. We've talked about the sacrificed lamb. Now, in this last section, we now talk about the singing servants, the worship, the singing servants. And I want you to note here in Revelation chapter number 5 and verses 8 through 9. 5, 8 through 9. It says, Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints, and they sang a new song. It says that they all had harps, and they all had golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Whenever the Lamb came and took the scroll out of the hand of him that sits on the throne, the four living creatures and 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Now, you need to understand this is representative language. Remember that. This is representative language. And so the representation of the elders, remember, it is the church, Old and New Covenant. They represent the Old and the New Covenant church. So this is Daniel and David and this is Abraham and Moses, all the saints of the Old Testament. And this is Peter and James and John, all the saints of the New Testament. They are all represented by these 24 elders, 12 and 12. The 12 tribes of Israel is represented in one half of the 24. And then the 12 apostles are represented in the second half of the 24, 12 and 12, making 24 a composite look of Old and New Testament believers. Don't forget that. So they are now falling down in worship. They represent all the saints throughout all of human history. From Adam all the way to the last believer to be born. All the saints throughout all of human history falling down and worshiping God. This is total worship of God of every believer. Every believer. 
total worship of God. This is an expectation. What are they worshiping for? They are expecting the seals to be opened. They're expecting the consummation of time. They're expecting the will and plan of God to be unveiled. And so they worship him upon that expectation. You have to hear this. You cannot miss this. That we who are believers, we want the will of God to come. We long for the will of God. We yearn for God's purposes. We yearn for God's plan to be achieved. We want God's will to be accomplished. Jesus said, pray it. He said, pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. This is the prayer of the believer. This is why the believers were worshiping Christ. Because now, when the seals are about to be opened, the will of God for the earth can be realized and the will of God for the earth can be accomplished. You don't want to miss the significance of the worship because God's will is being fulfilled. Whenever you pray for the will of God, it should always accompany worship. You never tell God what his will is. You never dictate to God what you want. You say to him, God, you are sovereign. You are holy. You are God. Your will be done in my life. I yield to your will. And that's what their worship accomplished. And so it says here in this verse, this beautiful verse, it says, and then the 24 elders fell down. It says the four living creatures before that, the four living creatures fell down. I want you to capture this very clearly. The four living creatures represent the representation of Christ. These are the angels, more than likely seraphim, that represent Christ, reflect the glory of Christ. And so all of the angels are taking their cue from the reflection of Jesus' glory. The, the four heads of those creatures, the man, the calf, the lion, the eagle. Remember that from a few weeks past? The four heads of those four living creatures are representations of the four natures and characteristics of Jesus. The four characteristics, I should say, of Jesus. And as they see these characteristics of him as the calf, this is the sacrificed calf or the sacrificed ox in the Old Testament. Or they see him as the eagle of the glory of the skies or the lion, the king of all created things. Or they see him as the man. He is fully God and fully man. In every characteristic of Jesus, they all are worshiping what they are seeing. The four, the four living creatures, they bow before him whom they are reflecting. They reflect him and bow before the one they reflect. Is that not what believers do? Is that not what we're called to do? We're called to reflect the one we worship. Listen, we're called to demonstrate the one we worship, that our life should look just like him, the ox, the calf, the eagle, the lion. Our life should resemble his nature, resemble his characteristics, resemble his heart, that Jesus for us is love, peace, power, humility, righteousness, he's kindness, he's mercy. And our life should reflect the one we worship. We should never worship a Christ that we are not willing to look like. The way you worship him is through how your life is lived, the way you look. It's hypocritical to worship a God we do not resemble. It's hypocritical to worship a God whom we do not resemble. If you do not look like him in your daily actions, in your daily uh, speech, in your daily interactions with people, in your relationships, in how the mercy you show, the righteousness you have, the way you love others, the purity of your body. If you do not look like him, then you cannot worship him because we worship whom we resemble. Are you listening to me, right? And so it says that they fall down. 
and worship him. The four creatures fall down. The 24 elders fall down to worship him. And it goes on. <clears throat> and it goes on now. And it says, having every one of them harps and golden vows full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. It says, every one of them had harps and golden bowls or vows full of incense. Now, first the harps. This is the instrumentation that they use to worship, but I don't want to breeze by this. I don't have a lot of time to deal with the harp, so I need you to listen carefully, and Lord, help me teach this correctly. Harps is one of the instruments that the Bible says Lucifer, if you remember, had in his body. In his body was his pipes and his harps, that he was actually an instrument. That Lucifer was an instrument. That's what he was. He was an instrument. He was an angel who was so in charge of the worship of all of heaven, like these four living creatures here in Revelation, Lucifer would have been the anointed cherub, the powerful cherub, whose very body was an instrument. So this means that the full totality of his life was encompassed and purposed for worship. Everything about him was invented and created to worship God. Everything about him, so much so that he was an instrument of worship. Now listen carefully. It says that in the hands of each of these, each of these worshipers are these harps. This is the instruments of worship meaning that they are meant to be worship. They are meant to express it because that's their instrumentality. Worship comes through them. You, me, we are instruments of worship. Instruments of worship. Not like Lucifer, of course, who fell because of pride, but we are instruments of worship in the same idea of the harps, the pipes, the, the, the melody that comes from the life of the being, the life of the creature, produces a melody that God hears as worship. The life, not just your raised hand, not just your voice, not just your mind, but it is the life that we live. The very harps are a part of our life. Are you hearing this? That everything about you is meant to be a worship unto God. Worship is not something that you do. Worship is something that you are. It's something that you are. You are a worship unto God. The harps and the vials and, and, and the pipes, the instrumentality of worship is a part of your nature, your life, your mindset, your being, your heart, your passion, your will. Everything about who you are is invested into worship. So you are not worshiping God on Sunday. You're worshiping God every day of your life. The harp is in your hands. The harp is in your hands. And what many of us are not capturing is that everything about who we are was meant to worship God. I mean, your personality worships God. Your intellect worships God. How you interact with people, it worships God. The job you do nine to five on your company, it worships God. How you love your spouse, how you love your children, it worships God. The, the conversations you have are a worship unto God. The lifestyle that you live is a worship unto God. How you take care or not take care of, Lord forgive us, of your body is a worship unto God. The purity of your body, your soul, the sanctification of body, soul, and spirit is a worship unto God. The sacrifices you make is a worship unto God. The gifts you give is a worship unto God. The mercy you show to those who are hurting is a worship unto God. I I mean, everything you do, the elevated hands as well as the elevated heart, it's a worship unto God, unto God. The harps, the harps, it's in the hand of every single one of them, every single one of them, much like the harps was in the body 
of the anointed cherub, Lucifer, who fell. Now be very careful. Be very careful. Because the most dangerous thing and the most beautiful thing you can do is worship. It's beautiful and it is dangerous. It's dangerous because in the process of worship, you have this connection with the almighty God. You are above the plane of the human life. You transcend the earthly plane. You are more than just being human when you're worshiping him. You're being spiritual when you're worshiping him. You're tapping into something beyond the norm, beyond the human, beyond the earthly. And pride, it seeps into that element. It seeps into that element as it did for Lucifer. When he said, I will exalt myself in the sides of the north. I will sit in the seat of the most high. Because worship is addictive. Worship is addictive. That's why you can't talk, tell folks too much how good and great and bad they are. Because their head begins to swell. Because worship is addictive. Praise is addictive. We need it to live. We need it for significance. We need it for self-confidence. When a mother praises a child, oh, it does wonders for that child's life. When a dad says to his son, boy, you did a good job. You're a great son. Oh, it does wonders for that boy's life. But then there's a fine line, fine line, where pride takes over. Because the moment you participate in worship, the giving or the receiving, the giving or the receiving, you are operating in a realm above the norm, above the earth, above the mundane. It's dangerous. It's dangerous. It's dangerous. Now listen carefully. When you worship God, you are engaging in warfare, number two. You're engaging in warfare. When you worship God, you are battling in warfare because you are operating in a realm where spirits dwell. You are operating in a realm where spirits dwell. Are you listening to me? And so worship is the easiest way to invite the attention of the enemy. It is the easiest way to invite the attention of the enemy because whenever you call out unto God, you are calling out through a spiritual realm where God dwells. And not only are you calling to him, you must call through that realm to get to him. And Satan hears, and demons hear, and enemy, the enemy hears, and his desire is when you open up your heart to that supernatural plane, that supernatural dimension. When you open up that heart, he sends in his forces inside. And these forces are depression, discouragement, anger. You know all the demons. You know all of them. You know all of them. You are very susceptible to spiritual warfare when you are worshiping. This is what happened to Lucifer. This is how Lucifer became Satan because he was operating in an area that he did not have respect for. He did not recognize the unique danger of being that close to God. Ah, oh, you got to hear this. You got to hear this. The danger of being that close to God. And here is the, here is the, um, here is the irony of that reality. Is that God calls us close to him. But in coming close to him, we attract the enemy. God calls us close to him, but in coming close to him, we attract opposition. God calls us, calls us close to him, but when coming close to him, we attract defense. We attract barriers. We attract that opposition that comes. How do you navigate that? You never worship. Here's number three. You never worship God without a dependence and a humility before him. You depend on him. You depend on him for everything. You depend on God for everything. For your breath, you depend on him. For the movement of your limbs, you depend on him. You depend on him for your help, for your strength, for your mentality. You depend on him for everything. And you come to him broken, humble. 
you come to him with this realization of your need for him. And as you worship him, the worship of God makes you smaller and him bigger. It makes you smaller and him greater. It's a worship in reverence unto him. In reverence unto him. And so it says, if you'd go back to look at the passage, it says that they fell down, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Incense, incense rises before God. Now listen, the harp is a melody that he hears. And the incense is a smell that he smells. The harp is a melody that he hears. And the incense is an odor that he smells. The hearing of the melody is so that it may be pleasing to him as a form of honor to him. As a form of worship before him. It is an honor to him. It is the praise that is given to him. It is the word spoken of how great he is, the truth about his nature and the truth about his character. It is when earth and the creatures and the angels come into agreement with who he is, right? God is great. And when I worship him, that's exactly what I'm saying. I agree with him. God is mighty. And when I worship him, I am coming into agreement with that truth. God is powerful, and when I worship him, I am coming into agreement with that truth. God is wise, and God is good, and God is mercy, and God is righteous, and when I worship him, I am coming into agreement with that truth. It is me and God vibrating on the same wavelength. It is me and God coming together in homologeo. I am saying the same thing that he is saying. I am saying what he is, right? That's worship. And the sound of it is agreement. It's a melody in his ears, harps. But then it says they have bowls, golden bowls, full of incense. Incense is the odor that he smells. This is acceptance. This is it's coming from a heart that is pure. It's coming from integrity. It's coming from a space of righteousness, right? It's coming from an integritous place. So as I smell this, I smell it in purity, in sincerity, in honesty, in integrity. It has no foul odor. It has no foul odor. When you worship God and you worship him out of an impure heart or you worship God without sincerity, or you worship God without righteousness, it is a stench. It is a stench in the nostrils of God. It is a foul odor in God's nose. Are you hearing this? And the way that incense works, this is how incense works. Incense works through fire. Incense works through fire. You have to burn it in order for the odor to be released. Many of us don't want to go through any fire. No test, no trial, no trying of our faith. But you cannot have an integritous, pure, honest, righteous, sweet-smelling worship unto God without fire. There has to be a burden, a trial, a trouble, a trial, a test of your faith. There has to be opposition. There has to be an enemy that hounds us. There has to be some pain in our life because it verifies our worship. It fortifies the worship experience. This is the odor of worship. This is the incense burnt by the fire. This is why in the Old Testament, you remember in the life of Moses and Aaron, Aaron's two sons, Nadab and Abihu. Remember those two boys? Aaron's two sons, Nadab and Abihu, two priests. These two boys, they offered strange fire unto the Lord. Strange fire just means that they had a concoction, um, an incense compound, an incense mixture, and they burned this incense mixture that did not come from God. It didn't come from God. It was their own recipe their own fleshly ingredients. 
their own fleshly recipe. They thought of it themselves and created the concoction on their own. God was not in the recipe. God did not tell them what spices to put into the incense. And they burned it before the Lord. And when the Lord smelled it, it didn't smell right. <laughs> and because it didn't smell right, he consumed those boys in a flash, in the snap of a finger in the twinkling of an eye. This is the importance of worshiping God in spirit and in truth. In spirit and in truth. Not just worshiping God because it's the thing to do. I get so tired of the church playing with worship. Quit it, stop it, go do something else. You don't understand the danger you're putting people in when you put them in a position to play with God's worship, to offer strange fire to him. These are golden bowls of incense that rise and God is testing the purity and the integrity of the heart of that worship. Where is it coming from? Whenever you come to church just to feel good or to have fun or to throw a party, stop it. Because you don't understand the danger that that kind of worship produces. It produces destruction. It is a foreign scent in the nostrils of God. God is a holy God. Therefore, a holy people must come to him to worship him. You gotta be holy. You gotta be holy. You gotta be integritous. You gotta be sincere. You gotta be pure. You can't do it. Because it's time to raise your hands. It's time to clap. You can't do it because it's time for me to go to church. You can't do it because my grandmama did it and my mama did it. And I, you can't do it for those reasons. It's got to be honest. It's got to be honest. It's the odor that he smells. And God has a very discerning nose, a very discerning nature where he knows the thoughts and the intents of the heart. That God understands the very heart of the person. And he knows exactly what's in our hearts. I want to come quickly to a close. It says, it says that they all sang, verse 9, and they sang a new song. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll. And they sang a new song. I want to zero in on a new song. There are nine times in the scriptures that the Bible speaks about a new song. Sing a new song. Sing a new song unto him. I've taken three of them to jot down and put it on our screen. Three of these new songs that they sang unto the Lord. They sang a new song. They, he has put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. Many will see it and fear will trust in the Lord. Psalm 40 and 3. It says, oh, sing to the Lord a new song. For he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained him the victory. Psalm 98 and 1. And then in Revelation 14 and 3, it says, they sang, as it were, a new song before the throne. Now, I want you to notice what it says here in Revelation 14 and 3. They sang, as it were, a new song before the throne. And no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. No one could learn that song. And so the idea of new song progresses in its revelation throughout the Bible, throughout the scriptures. Why a new song? Why a new song? Well, it says here clearly that this new song, no one could learn it. Therefore, the song has in it something that is of a mysterious nature. The mystery of the song, the mystery of the song is the aspect of God that it worships, that it acknowledges. It's some new aspect of God that no one has seen or grasped or understood. When it says that no one could learn the song, it doesn't mean that the song was so complicated in its chord structure that nobody could learn it. 
It doesn't mean that the song had so many rises and falls and twists and turns that the, uh, the, the, the structure of the song's musicality was so complex that no one could learn it. That's not what that means. It means the meaning of the song, the meaning of the song, what the song was saying, what the song was meant to mean to the one that was singing it, the depth of its meaning no one could grasp except those to whom the song had been given. Now, taking, taking Revelation 14 and 3, taking the meaning of this idea of a new song and plugging it back in to the other passages in the book of Psalms, which talk about a new song. So go back up to Psalm 40, and it says, He has put a new song in my mouth, Praise to our God. He has put a new song in my mouth, not the physical mouth only, but the heart. Out of the mouth, the heart speaks. That God has revealed some new aspect of his nature that I have not yet come to fully understand. Let me give you an idea. An idea here is this. God is good. You know that. I know that. God is good. And I've been saying God is good all of my, my Christian life. But I go through experiences in my life which highlight to me an aspect of God's goodness that I had never noticed or considered before. God is good to me and my nine-year-old self. But good means something different in my 19-year-old self. And good means something different in my 29-year-old self. And good means something completely different in my 49-year-old self. As I mature in Christ, the goodness of God takes on deeper levels of meaning. Deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper levels of meaning. So in Psalm 40, back at that passage, please, it says that he put a new song in my mouth. It's not the song that's so new. It's the meaning of the song that is so new. Praises to our God. Many will see it and be awestruck, not at how melodious I'm singing. No, who cares about how melodious I sing? They're awestruck at the meaning of the song. We've not seen him this way before. We've not noticed this about him before. We've not understood this about him before. It's a new song. And then it says in Psalm 98, verse 1, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. For he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained him the victory. He has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained him the victory. Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. Why? Because he's done new things for us. He has brought us into new victories. He has given us new strengths. He has fought for us new battles. He has shown us new power. Are you getting the idea? And every revelation I have of him, my song gets deeper. You see, many people worship God without having a depth of experience with God. And when you don't have an experience with God, you can't sing a new song. You're singing the same old song. It's not the words of the song that's old. It's the meaning of the song to your heart that is old. You take one song, what a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. Old to him, old to him, old to him. But every time I sing that hymn against the backdrop of my experiences with God, against the backdrop of what God has done for me, how God has blessed me, what God has saved me from, what God delivered me out of, my experiences with God, it gives me a fresh and new meaning to the old hymn. It's a new song. Same old song, but a brand new song at the same time. And so it says, it's very clear, the song that they sang is a new song. Their song does two things, and then I'm done. Their song affirms the sovereignty of God and his sacrifice. 
It affirms the sovereignty of God and his sacrifice. Go up to the previous slide, please. The sovereignty of God and his sacrifice. It says, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain. You are worthy. That's sovereignty. You were slain. That's a sacrifice. The song they sang affirmed God's sovereignty and his sacrifice. It affirmed that Jesus, you're sovereign. It affirmed that you were slain for our sins. You were slain for the redemption of mankind. You are worthy to own the earth because you died for the earth. The depth of their song was an affirmation of the truth of who God is. I, whenever we come to worship God, don't worship God singing about your problems. Don't worship God singing about your burdens and what's wrong and what's going wrong. That's not worship. That's blues. That ain't worship. That's blues. You're just singing the blues. That is not worship. Worship is affirming him. Worship affirms his sovereignty. Worship speaks of his sacrifice. Worship affirms what he's done, who he is, his greatness. That's worship. Don't come to God singing the blues. Don't come to God singing about woe is me and I can't make it. I mean, come to God singing about worship. Secondly, secondly. It didn't just only A, affirm his sovereignty and sacrifice, but B, it affirms our salvation and our sonship. Here it says, and you have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. It says, you have redeemed us to God. That's salvation. It says, and you have made us kings and priests. That's our sonship. Listen carefully. When you come to sing before the Lord, you affirm his sovereignty and his sacrifice, yes, and you affirm your rightful position in relationship to Jesus. You're redeemed. You're saved. You're born again. You're a child of God. Worship him because of that. Not because you're burdened or you're going through trouble or you're going through trial or this is wrong and you're climbing the rough side of the mountain. Worship God because of your position in relationship to Jesus. Sing the songs that affirm his care for you. Sing the songs that affirm his love for you. Sing the songs that affirm his protection over you. Sing songs that affirm the position that your faith is supposed to be in. It says, we are made kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. That he has made us somebody special. (laughs) He's made us somebody special, a treasured possession. He's made us in his own image. Sing songs that affirm where your faith is should be in relationship to Jesus Christ. And so I'll close with reading the final passages. Verse 11 says to us, Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. (laughs) A number that you can't even number. It was too many to number. It was more than my eyes could understand. And they all said with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Verse 13, And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea, And all that are in them, this is everything, everything. Things inanimate. I mean, things that don't, that aren't even human. Under the earth, in the sea, it says everything. I heard saying blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and forever ever. Even the demons in hell, they know that he is Lord. (laughs) 
Even the demons in hell, they know that he is Lord. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Father, I thank you and I praise you in the name of Jesus for your great wisdom and your great strength. May we learn how to worship you. May worship not be a ritual. May it not be something that is plastic. May it not be a facade and a mask we wear on our face. May worship come from a pure heart, a pure life that's burned in the fire and rises before you as a sweet smell. And we'll give your name praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen again. How I love you so much. I thank God for this opportunity we've had to study together, to worship together, to read the word. I hope that this book is coming alive every time we read it. I hope you're seeing new truths in it. I love you very much. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious unto you and grant you his peace and your rising and setting today and forevermore in Jesus' name. Amen and amen again. God bless. Can't wait to see you Sunday. Don't miss Sundays. Sir Nona Clayton, a great time. All ladies, make sure you're here or watching my stream. God bless. Love you much. Bye-bye.